All right, in this video, we're going to conduct a correlated groups t-test by hand. And we're going to deal with a hypothetical experiment. So if you've ever seen the matrix, you remember that Nemo had to choose between a red pill and a, and a blue pill. And in this hypothetical experiment, we're going to uh, think about a pill that could improve a person's memory, which would be really important for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And there are some medications that appear to help a little bit with um, staving off declines, especially in short-term memory in Alzheimer's disease. So let's test one of those pills. So our independent variable is going to be essentially a new medication delivered orally that we think might improve immediate recall, or short, and that's a form of short-term memory. And there's really gonna be two levels to this experiment. One, the first level is when the person has not taken the medication at all. So this would be before any intervention. And then the second level will be actually taking the pill. And so we need to have measurements, right, of uh, immediate recall uh, under both levels for the same individual. So the dependent variable then is going to be the number of words that are recalled from a word list uh, two weeks after first taking the medication regimen. Okay, so we'll do that uh, pre-test and then again two weeks after first taking the medication regimen. So let's visualize the design. Um, pretty much we're dealing within subjects here. Uh, so we'll have the same research uh, participant participating in both of our samples, right? In sample one, um, these are going to be uh, scores on a wordless test prior to taking the medication. And then the person is going to take the medication for two weeks. And then the second sample will be that same person, but now it's after they've taken the medication. And we're really looking for differences in scores on our uh, word list recall, right? That's gonna be the D score. And we're expecting that individuals will remember more words from a list of words and will identify those words as having, as having been present in the list after having taken the medication. Okay. So we need to just walk through our steps. Again, these steps will be just like what we've done for uh, one, uh, uh, one sample t-test and independent groups t-test. We just modify things a little bit for the correlated groups t-test. We need to ask a testable research question. And in this case, does the pill increase correct immediate recall from a word list? And then we need to define our population. And the answer there is that these are individuals with mild to moderate Alzheimer's symptoms. Then we walk through the steps. And the first thing we do is we choose the correct statistical test. So our first question is, well, how many samples are there? There's actually two samples, right? Because we have a sample of scores that were pre-test and a sample of scores that are post-test or post-intervention. So there's really two samples. Now, if we had only one sample, we'd do a z-test for a sample mean or a one sample t-test. If we had more than two samples, we would do analysis of variance. But because we have a pre and post scores for the same individuals, we'd say there's two samples and those are the pre-test and post-test scores. Now, are the groups or the samples independent? Well, the answer here now is no, right? Because it's the same person being tested twice. Okay, so we need to pair those scores together. Okay, and if we were going to uh, say that the scores were independent, we do the independent groups t-test. And since they're not independent, uh, we are doing the correlated groups t-test or dependent samples t-test. Okay, step four, select a one-tailed directional or a two-tailed non-directional test of significance. In this case, we're gonna say two-tailed makes sense. And the rationale is that it's a new medication. Uh, it's not clear that memory will only improve, could get worse from taking the medication. Then we're gonna walk through the steps and we're gonna specify the null and the alternative hypotheses. Now, in this case, the null hypothesis is that the mean D score should be zero, right? If there's no effect for the drug on short-term memory, we would expect the mean of all the D scores to be the same post-test as pre-test. So the mean D should be zero, and in a two-tailed test, the alternative hypothesis is going to be that the mean D score will not equal zero. Now we're gonna take alpha as alpha equaling 0.05 because we're doing a two-tailed test that 0.05 is going to be distributed on both sides of our sampling distribution in the tails. 
Look, we're all the way to step seven already. Now we need to identify the critical values for rejecting the null hypothesis. Now this part can be just a little bit tricky, okay? Because we need to figure out where those cut points are in our sampling distribution. Now, here's the thing. Our n is actually seven in this case. We're gonna have seven subjects, okay? And what this refers to, the n actually, when we figure degrees of freedom, is going to be the number of d scores minus one. Okay, so even though there are two samples, so let's say we have seven subjects and they're measured twice, you might say, okay, well, seven subjects measured twice, shouldn't our total n be 14? No, it's the number of different scores or d scores. So it's going to equal, um, the n is going to equal the total number of our subjects. And then the degrees of freedom will be the number of d scores minus one. So six degrees of freedom. Alpha equals 0.05, and we're doing a non-directional two-tailed test. That's going to yield a critical value of plus or minus 2.447. And that's where we'd put the cutoff point. So anything in between those cutoff points, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And anything in the tails, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So let's take a look at some sample data. Let's say there were 50 words in the list, and we're just trying to find out how many words the subject correctly identifies as having been in a test list. So the total possible they could get right would be 50. Okay, so on the left we have our pretest column, and on our right we have our uh, post-test column, and the number of correct responses are included there. Our n is obviously seven. Now the d-score is just the value, the paired value from uh, the, the post-test subtracted from the pretest. So when you see, for example, a d-score of negative three, what that means is that the pretest score was three correct answers less than the post-test score. Okay. Now, how the d-score is expressed, um, some folks like to you know, switch x2 and x sub, x sub 2 and x sub 1 around if uh, the sign matters. You know, uh, it's easy to kind of confuse what this negative three means because the person's actually getting three more answers correct. So you'd almost sort of expect it to be a positive three, but because it's set up as x sub 1 minus x sub 2, it's going to be negative three. So you just need to interpret that correctly meaning that the negative three refers to the pretest having a score that is three points less or three answers uh, uh, less correct than the post-test. Okay, and then we're gonna just do that for every single paired observation or score. And then we get down at the bottom, the mean D-score. And really the big question is going to be, is this mean D-score significantly different from zero. Okay, so now we uh, move it out into the tabular format. And again, there's a number of different ways that textbooks will show you how to do this. I'm using what's called a tabular format because it's really explicit in terms of how you get the numbers. But there's also computational formulas that get you down to some squares where you don't necessarily have to do this tabular format. Either way is correct so long as you get to a point where you've computed sums of squares directly. So here's our scores for the first variable. That's the pretest. For the second variable, that's the post-test. Here's uh, our D scores, which is the difference between pre and post, keeping in mind the way that that's computed in the sign. And then we uh, compute the mean of all the D scores, which is negative 3.86. The next step that we're going to do is subtract the mean of the d-scores from each d-score, right? And that's the column, the second column toward the right, second from the end. And then we're going to square those deviation scores. That gives us the sum of squares. All right, from there we need to calculate the estimated population standard deviation of the d-scores, and we need to do this because we need to eventually calculate the standard error. Okay, so the formula for this is pretty straightforward, and I've combined a couple of steps into just one formula to make life easier. This numerator right here is our sum of squares, and that's what we calculated in the table.
The denominator is degrees of freedom. That's just n minus 1. So we know that n equals 7, so that's going to be 6. Now, if you take just this, if you get rid of the square root sign, this is the formula for the estimated population variance. The moment you put a square root over it, it becomes the estimated population standard deviation of the d squares, not the variance. Okay, So really all we're doing here is we're saying, okay, th this right here is our variance estimate. And then we take the square root of that, right, and that becomes our standard deviation. So our estimated population standard deviation of the d scores is 1.95. So now that we have that, we need to get our estimated standard error. Okay, once we have our estimated population standard deviation of the d scores, then we need to calculate the estimated standard error of the mean of the different scores, which is, again, a mouthful. Okay, but it's really a pretty simple calculation, and you've kind of seen it before, because if you think about the standard error of the mean, the formula looks like this. This is when we knew the population variance, right? So going back to z-test for a single sample mean, that's what our standard error looked like. And then when we did a one sample t-test, the formula looked like this. Right, that's why people say you know there's a lot of similarity between a correlated groups t-test and a um, <clears throat> one sample uh, t-test. These formulas look really similar. The only difference, really, that you see, right? This should be x right there. The only difference that you see is that we've substituted d, the mean of d, and d into the formula instead of mean of x, and then x. Right. So um, so what we're doing here is we're just uh, estimating standard error of the mean of the different scores. We take our estimated standard deviation, which was computed in the last step, and we put it in the numerator. And then we take the square root of n, which we already knew was 7. Right. And that ends up being 0.74. And then the last step in terms of the computations involves getting t obtained, right? The actual t ratio that we're going to calculate. So the formula for that is going to be the mean of d minus the mu of d in the population divided by the estimated standard error. Now, in the population, we're going to assume that there's no difference between uh, the population of scores represented on pretest and post-test. So this value is going to usually be entered in as zero, right? Not always, there are some exceptions to that, but usually it's going to be zero. So what that means is we're just gonna take the mean d score, uh, d score, which we already calculated early on. That's gonna be negative 3.86. What that means is on average, pretest scores were negative 3.86 points or correct answers less than the post-test scores. Then we're going to subtract what we assume the null hypothesis would state in the population that the mean from the pretest to the post-test won't change, so that's going to be zero. And then we divide by our estimated standard error of the mean of the different scores, which we calculated in the last step, which is 0.74. Okay, and that's going to work out to negative 5.23. Okay. All right, then we have to make a decision, right? We have to compare our obtained t-score to the critical value for t. And what we've said is that our obtained t-score fell uh, 5.23 standard errors below the mean of the sampling distribution. That easily exceeded our critical value of negative uh, 2.447. And of course, it could have been on either side because it was a two-tailed test. Therefore, we're going to reject the null hypothesis, the probability that we would observe a sample mean that fell 5.23 standard errors from the mean of the sampling distribution simply by chance or because of sampling error is really pretty unlikely, less than 0.05. Therefore, we reject the null.
And then in our 10th step, of course, we generalize back to the population, revise subsequent hypotheses, hypotheses, think about experiments that we might do in the future. And if we were to write this up in APA, uh, we'd use the standard format for reporting a t-test. So that's going to be, we identify the type of test itself, t-test, then the degrees of freedom in the test, then t obtained, that's our t ratio, the p-value, the likelihood that the results could be obtained by Sample error, sampling error, we want that to be small to reject the null hypothesis. And then the effect size. Now we haven't calculated effect size. We're gonna save that for a subsequent video. We'll come back and do that. So for now, we just won't report it, but this is the way it would look in APA formatting. It would be T and then in parentheses six equals negative 5.23 with the probability less than 0.05. Now keep in mind this negative value, it sounds a little non-intuitive because you're seeing an increase in number of words recalled as a result of the medication. So you might think to yourself, well, shouldn't that value be positive? The way you have to interpret it, this negative value uh, is just sort of an artifact of the way the D-score is calculated. The negative value refers back to the pretest scores, right? Really, I mean, what you're saying is that the um, uh, the effect, the pretest scores were lower than the post-test scores, and that's why the T-ratio is actually going to end up being negative. Okay, so uh, in our next video, we're going to run through the same data um, using JAST.